Hi everyone, thank you very much for being here. My name is Nikos Sobirakopoulos and I will be chairing this discussion. So this is the eighth consecutive year that we're doing the Battle of Ideas in Athens. So Battle of Ideas is a festival of debates. And what we're doing is we're discussing really difficult issues, but we try to do it in a civilized way. So we don't shy away from controversial and difficult issues, but the idea is we don't try to destroy the opponent, we try to put our arguments on the table and see how the truth comes out. But a big part of Battle of Ideas is also the participation from the audience. So 50% of the time of its panel, it's audience contributions. And it doesn't have to be necessarily a question, it can also be your take on the topic and your opinion. So before I start, let me say a huge thank you to the Hellenic American Union and a huge thank you to Lila Magnotti and to Mirto Celedi because if they weren't helping us, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. And as I said, this is the eighth consecutive year that we are in partnership, uh, the, the Academy of Ideas is in partnership with the Hellenic American Union. So what is the topic today? The topic today is toxic politics. So we're going to discuss this issue with the following speakers and I'll present them to you in the order they will speak. On my far right, geographically but not politically, I've got Timandra Harkness. Timandra is a journalist, is a comedian, is a writer, and is a broadcaster. So she, she has written a lot of books. The, the, her last book is Big Data, Does Size Matter? And to prove that it's a book, good book, I always give it as a textbook to my students on the issue of big data. But most importantly for this debate, she has run a program in BBC called How to Disagree, which is what we're going to what we're going to do today. On the far left, I have Dr. Anna Nicolau. Always on the left. Anna is a sociologist and researcher. She has had a career in the National Center for Social Research in Eke. And she also teaches in the psychology and general education programs in Hellenic American College. On my left, I have Professor Constantina Botsiu. She's an associate professor of modern history and international politics and the director of the Center for Greek and International History at the University of the Peloponnese. And she's also the author of The Balkans and the Cold War, which is in English, but it's also been translated in Greece, I think. 2019, yes. And on my right, I have Labrini Thoma. She's a journalist with a rich experience in print, radio, and web media. And she's currently working in the, the independent uh, media for a uh, press project GR. So the rules are five to seven minutes each. I'll be strict with time. And then we go to the audience. Are you good? Good. Demand. Yeah. Good. Uh, okay, five to seven minutes. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and discuss this in an international setting because it's a topic, as Nico said, that I've been interested in for some years. And the, the radio series, How to Disagree, started from me feeling that we were disagreeing a lot, and I think disagreement is good, but we were doing it very badly, certainly in the, in the UK context. And I wanted to find some ideas about why that's the case, but also some practical suggestions for how to disagree better. Um, not trying to escape from disagreement, because I think it's, it's inescapable that we will have different ideas about the world and what we should do, but also it would be a terrible thing to try and escape from it, because that would be to assume that the ideas that are dominant now are the best ones we could possibly have, and nobody is allowed to have any other ideas, and we cannot improve on them which would, uh, would, it would at best be a lack of ambition, I think, and at worst be some kind of Stalinism. So not a good thing. So disagreement is good, but I, I do think we, we could be doing it better. But I, could I ask you a, a couple of questions? Who in the audience feels that they identify strongly with a particular political point of view or position that you would say was part of your identity? Okay, only a few people. Uh, and, and, and I'm keeping it open because I know there are different ways of looking at it. Some people identify the political party. Certainly in the UK, there is recent research showing a lot of people identify strongly with whether they voted leave or remain in the Brexit referendum, even though that's quite a recent uh, thing that's happened. And well, the other question is then, assuming that you have some kind of a political position or leaning, 
uh, and that your parents maybe have a kind of political leaning or position, which they, they may not, or may, they may not agree on it, but if your parents have a political leaning, do you think, who thinks they would be happy if you brought home somebody of the very opposite political leaning and said, mother and father, this is the person I'm going to marry, who, who thinks they would be happy with that? One person and one person of it, and okay. Green mothers are never happy. <laughs> okay, well, bear that in mind then as a, as a baseline. And I ask these questions because there's a recent report in the UK that asked these questions, uh, first of all, about how strongly people identify. And they found that people identify less with the two big political parties, Labour and Conservatives, the, the left and right parties traditionally, and more with how they voted in the referendum, which I, I think is interesting because until the referendum was called, uh, at least a third of people really had no opinion at all on it. It wasn't important, but now it's, it's become important. And they also asked who who would be happy. They asked who would be happy if their child married somebody from the other side. And I'm I'm sorry to say that a minority of people answering the survey would be happy if their child married someone from the other side. And interestingly, the the people on the Remain side who think of themselves as much more liberal and open were less likely to be happy, but only, I think, 20% of them would be happy with a child marrying somebody who, who had voted leave, whereas the leavers were a bit better on maybe 30, 40% would be happy, but still less than half. So it's become very personal. And, uh, and I think this is something that has changed recently. Uh, I know that th there's always been a sense that if somebody profoundly disagrees with you politically, maybe you can never really see the world the same way. But I, I think in the past, maybe politics fitted into a framework that everybody understood what the framework was. So you might disagree, but you possibly agreed on the, on the ground on which you were disagreeing, you, 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 on where the dividing line was drawn. And I'm not sure that's, that's true anymore. And I think that's possibly partly why politics has become what you might call toxic, that has become much more bad-tempered, much more personal. People tend to get more angry and hurt when their ideas are, are questioned or argued with because it has become a matter of our identity. That it's not, if you, if you disagree with me, you're not just saying, no, I think your ideas are wrong, here's why. You're, you're saying that I am a, I'm a bad person, or perhaps a stupid person, or that I'm bigoted, or that I don't understand the way the world is, and you attack who I feel I am. And then it becomes very difficult to have a reasonable discussion, because if you're saying that I, as a person, uh, am, am bad, or, or stupid, or uneducated, or that the way I see the world is completely invalid, and you don't share it at all, then it's very difficult to have any common ground to, to build on. Uh, I had a, I, I think this is, this is the root of why politics is, feels so uh, emotionally frightening at the moment, I think. It is true that there are big disputes happening, there are big disagreements about the way the world should be, and those are not gonna go away. Uh, however, however civil and reasonable we are, we will still have profound disagreements about how we think the world should be in the future. And we will still feel strongly attached to those, I think, because if you're not emotional about politics, then why would you put the effort in? Uh, there's, there's been some research showing that people who have a brain injury and can't feel emotions at all struggle to make even basic decisions about what to eat or where to go and what to do. So emotions are, are, are absolutely tied up to our reasons for doing things. And people who say, oh, the problem is you're really emotional about politics and, and I'm rational are deluding themselves because they also are emotional, otherwise why would they care enough to argue with you? Uh, we're all emotional about politics and that's a good thing because it means we care and we care about how the future might look uh, and that's why we're invested in it. But that doesn't mean we can't also be reasonable. And I think what we need, and it's a very difficult thing to, to ask for, and I'm not sure how we get there from here, but what we need is what can we could describe as a secular space. And I don't by secular mean that religion is banished. I mean that it's a space that is separate from our personal 
uh, opinions about values, maybe, uh, about things like, I mean, includes things like religion, personal beliefs, emotions, how we personally like to live our lives. And we separate those off. We say we need a shared space where we can agree on ground rules. We can agree on how to disagree. We can agree, for example, that this is how democracy works, these are the, these are the rules, and this is how we do the voting, and then the, this, we all accept the result of the voting, whatever it is and whatever the system is. Or these are the rules of the argument, and uh, we're all going to argue on the same rules, and then if we lose the argument, we say, okay, well, I lost that argument. We don't say, oh, no, I must change the rules now. And so I don't know how we get there from here, but I think this is what we really need, somewhere we can put aside our very personal feelings about this is me and this is my life and agree some very basic ground rules about how we can discuss and argue and, uh, and how we can make democracy work in an age where maybe the disagreements are new and don't fit into the old system. Is that, have I kept my time? Right. Just, right. almost. <laughs> Good Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, will, I will start by saying that the battle of ideas started a little bit uh, earlier than schedule, uh, about two hours ago with my class. So we reflected on the topic. I have my dear students here. And I asked them this basic question, is toxic politics something new? And unanimously, they said no. It's not a recent phenomenon. They don't see it as a recent phenomenon. They dissected it very well, and they explained the reasons, which I hope that you will contribute tonight. I want to hear you. Uh, so this year's uh, Battle of Ideas poses a lot of questions. And uh, first of all, I agree with my students. It's not a recent phenomenon. Uh, the was toxicity. I would also uh, agree with Sandra that the, uh, sometimes when we debate, we feel hurt because for, it's not a matter of ideas or different points of view, but we take it personally because it hurts our identity. And when identities are hurt, emotions also hurt. So I will just narrowly focus on a particular issue and debate a little bit migration, which relates to identity, and how it is projected on the news uh, I'm not a social media person, but I've read a lot of comments in the internet myself. So I'll take immigration, which is, uh, has currently become the most toxic, perhaps, issue. And it was brought also to the attention of the Security Council by the High Commissioner of uh, the Refugees, that there's a lot of toxic politics in the media, in politics, in, uh, in the social media. So. Um, According to uh, an article uh, published in The Guardian, uh, when the New Labour came into power in 1997, it, uh, 3%, for, only for the 3% of the public cited migrate immigration as a, as a problem. Uh, by the time of the EU referendum in 2016, uh, that figure grew to 48%. Uh, this is attributed to uh, a single decision taken by the Labour government in 2004 to open uh, uh, UK borders to the post-war Eastern Europeans. Uh, and there was a lot of racism that grew up uh, in the United Kingdom. Similar things that are happening here today happen also in uh, the UK United Kingdom. By the way, I just want to um, mention that it was not a bad decision because based on the four freedoms of the European Union, there is free movement of population. And we're talking about around 10 countries that in 2004, it was the fifth enlargement joined uh, the European Union. Uh, of course, uh, there were reactions by the public. The same is still uh, going on here. Um, the migration is not, at least for me, a problem in itself, but rather the way political parties and journalists discuss it, and policies they implement in response. Uh, in recent issue has dominated and distorted politics since, uh, for example, the early 90s. 
by the uh, we have the collapse of uh, communism and we have conflict around the world, which also drive uh, migration. So the mainstream media, we didn't have social media then, played a significant role in presenting the country as being constantly flooded by immigrants from post-war Eastern Europe, and especially Albania. The Albanian immigrant was presented as a person who breaks into houses, steals, and kills without remorse. Many crimes were attributed to Albanian immigrants that were later identified that were committed by Greeks. Uh, but uh, the mainstream uh, media did not mention that. At the same time, the government rounded up Albanian irregular immigrants and sent them back to Albania in the so-called boom operations. And uh, uh, th this kind of uh, media coverage, of course, continues even today. Just as Greece uh, is exposed, was exposed to the shocks of the economic crisis, the IMF structural, structural adjustment programs and the stringent stage, uh, the Greeks were simultaneously bombarded with stories about illegal immigrants producing uh, sorry, about illegal immigrants producing hostile rhetoric and policy responses. One politician particularly suggested to shoot them when trespassing the borders. And uh, migration is generally uh, presented as unmanageable. So going back to identity, cultural identity is the focus with much of the media echoing the idea that the presence of uh, immigrants and refugees undermine a cohesive sense of Greekness. We became witness of hate and racially motivated attacks by the Nazi party uh, Golden Dawn. It's not a far-right party, it's a Nazi party. Uh, also the media uh, demonized Islam as both the Greek national identity, integral part of which is orthodoxy, uh, and their way of life. Uh, and we saw that very recently uh, a group of Greeks stood so low as to hold anti-migrant pork eating an alcohol barbecue near the Avatar refugee camp in Thessaloniki. Uh, overall, the presence of migrants and refugees is considered an alien cultural disruption of a previous stable society. So no wonder why racism is found in the news as much on the streets. At the same time, successive governments promised to tackle the problem but failed again and again, and again only inflaming public resentment and mistrust of, uh, over the issue. Uh, the overwhelming media narrative of previous series of government was that it opened the floodgates to immigration. Uh, the present government decided to transfer refugees from the islands into deprived parts of uh, uh, mainland Greece, fueling voters' uh, distrust and anti-migration uh, sentiments. So on the, on the one hand, we have this type of handling, and I'm talking about the political rhetoric used, not only the actual policy responses. So on the other hand, people are disoriented, trying to make sense of a vastly and rapidly changing world. So when people raise even legitimate concerns about refugees and migrants, uh, various journalists, politicians, and other groups won't let them articulate their perspective. Uh, extreme, even leftists, uh, their blood boils over people, mis people's misguided, opinion, uh, misguided opinions about the refugees and migrants, and they point the figure and uh, making accusations, uh, you're racist, you're xenophobic, uh, fueling further resentment. Uh, so um, we have to really consider all these things. I mean, uh, there are obviously different views, but uh, there was uh, the whole thing has been represented in a particular way in the mainstream media, in the social media, by politicians, the rhetoric they use, uh, uh, like, for example, if I'm translating that correctly, we are being flooded by um, illegal invaders. Inva they, they are invading the country. I mean, these are uh, words with heavy weight. Uh, and so we fuel anti, uh, if that particular type of discourse fuels anti migrant uh, sentiment. But on the other hand, the response 
is not to accuse everybody who raises an objection. We understand the fear because the world is not stable anymore. We're not living in the Cold War period where borders were solidified. There was, yes, there was a threat of nuclear uh, war, but uh, the, the whole system was balanced between the two superpowers. What we are experiencing now, are we finished? Yeah, so um, just to wrap it up, what we are experiencing is a, a, a world full of uncertainty. So we cannot talk to people and I put them labels all the time. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, many thanks to the organizers for inviting me here. My first point is that life without disagreement would be horrific. And a world without political dissent would be totalitarian. And many countries have been there, including Europe. So, uh, uh, disagreement is part of the freedom of expression, and freedom of expression is fundamental to democracy. But, of course, we can uh, see different uh, attitudes towards disagreement. The way we disagree is different from time to time. Now, the protests have taken to the streets, and this is not a new phenomenon, we've seen that again. We've seen that back in the 1960s and back in the 1980s. By that time, there was a reaction to ugly politics, to uh, like the, the Watergate affair, to unfair wars like Vietnam, to the violation of human rights in the USSR and China, for many different reasons than today. Today, there are four major differences, I believe. The first one is the combination, the toxic combination of globalization and the financial crisis of 2008. Um, many Western democracies were um, very um, secure and safe because they believed that the end of communism and the end of the Cold War would not bring disagreement from within, but it, ha it has happened. The crisis of 2008 has generated uh, a general protest against uh, the coupling of liberal democracy with uh, neoliberal economics uh, of globalization. Of course, we try to hide it, but it's there, and we see that it growing and growing again. A great source of uh, disagreement and political dissent is uh, the, uh, the rising, the, the twinning gap between the rich and the poor, social inequality. Another, the morals that go with it. We have labeled people that are poor the losers of globalization or the left behinds. This is a moral label and they feel very bad when they compare themselves to the winners of globalization or the so-called uh, elites. The gap is usually economic and not uh, cultural. Uh, it's not a quality gap. Uh, if you have watched uh, Martin Scorsese's The Wolf of Wall Street, you have the whole picture what this is about. Second, the social dimensions of globalization, they stress identity politics, as was mentioned before. In a quality within rich societies and mass migration into the same societies create an explosive mix. Identity conflicts are harder to negotiate and compromise, we know that. Migration is a major vote-winning source of toxic politics in the past 20 years. Third, each and every protester can voice discontent through the social media. The classical media we used to know uh, excluded many people. Only elites had access to newspapers, to uh, writing, to, to TV. Now everybody can become a journalist of himself. So this means we get to hear much more views than in the past. So this includes also many more, uh, much more disagreements. The fourth is the anxiety of analysts and governments to impose a populist pattern on protest. This has deepened the gap between elites and non-elites, between elites and the people. And toxic politics have become even more toxic by this differentiation. Now, what can be done? First of all, we must accept that the phenomenon of angry protests will not disappear anytime soon. We belong to generations that are not accustomed to conflict. We're not accustomed to disagreeing, and we're not accustomed uh, to risk. If we ask the uh, older generations that have experienced two world wars, uh, or national schism and civil wars, they will say this is nothing. But we're not used to that. So it's uh, really scary when it comes up with new qualities. What we can influence is the, the way we disagree. Uh, it, and especially there, uh, there's a lot uh, to be done by role models and by public uh, influencers. And by that, uh, I mean especially educators, uh, politicians, uh, journalists. Uh, but also athletes, artists, scientists, parents, 
this is, uh, these are all uh, groups that show people how to disagree. And they can uh, teach people to disagree uh, and keep uh, the disagreement on a civil level. Arguments can be sharp, must be sharp, otherwise we cannot reach uh, novelty, innovation. We cannot reach uh, new ideas, but we have to uh, keep it civil. Character assassination, for instance, this is very toxic and it, uh, it happens all the time. People uh, enjoy character assassination, especially if they love arguments. Uh, this is something we should exclude from our public discussions. Second, public figures must become again good listeners. They have forgotten to listen, they just talk. And especially in the Greek case, but I think also in other cases in Europe and in America, TV journalists and politicians have been the best educators of toxic politics through the notorious window talks, where they gain free publicity by yelling simultaneously at each other. But now they're shocked because toxic politics are there. Last but not least, disagreements need to lead to new ideas and political change. It's the only way to show people that they have been heard. If we keep politics and business as usual, nothing will change, then we know what the next step is. If there's not reform, usually we have state violence or rebellion or both, and that would really hurt democracy. In the meantime, we should remind ourselves and each other that the people we disagree with are not our enemies. They just have different opinions, or they have different experience. We should respect that. We can gain from that. We can become better through this agreement. There is a huge difference between an enemy and a person that disagree with, disagrees with us. And it's only in democracies that we can tell the difference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will be a little more personal. I have been bullied myself in the public and uh, in professional space in the past for several different reasons. Some common to millions of people, some because of my personal intellectual constitution, which is not about very stable. First of all, as a woman in a professional and public culture where men are supposed to do the thinking. Now, this is a very different panel from the usual panels we meet in discussions. But I don't know if it exists in other cultures that like go home, lady, and wash your dishes. <laughs> no. It's something that you hear a lot in Greece, especially when you're trying to do something that women are not traditionally um, used to do. Uh, okay, count again. One, as a woman. Two, as a left-leaning or extreme left-leaning person, depends on your views, that happens to embrace certain ideas that don't fit or have fallen out of favor with modern left. One of them is I'm um, an uh, Orthodox Christian. Second is I believe in the nationalism and patriotism as opposed to globalism and a down of the nation's mindset. I believe in the power of history and tradition which has to be combined with radical thinking and I'm opposed to blind progressivism. So, and of course, in Cycles that adopt part of my later ideas, say in Christian Orthodox or patriotic cycles, they will oppose all my left leaning ideas because that's the way we see the world. Um, they will be counter to state violence, uh, who see us, I don't know, opposing things. Uh, that for distribution, they will see me as, uh, you know, uh, a radical for believing in gay rights or. All that. One effect of the toxic climate, the very important one I must say, that creates even more toxicity in any public discussion is favoring picking sides. One can have a public career by favoring one or the other side. Let's use the US for example, because big politics are lesser known, and because I want to get out of here in one piece. <laughs> in, in, you can have a public career by being either pro-Republican or pro-Democrat. You can even have a career by going all the way to the extremes on either side, say a fanatic gun-toting Trump supporter or a Trump supporter or a hysterical social justice warrior. But it's not impossible to have a career or even be heard patiently 
if you have a unique perspective that bridges or goes beyond those signs. At best, you can keep out of the whole debate by being extremely, cautiously, and tiresomely centrist, basically saying nothing. And saying nothing serves no one. The current toxic climate favors extremists of both sides, as well as a political and critical centrists. In other words, it's impossible to strike a personal balance of ideas to adopt whatever you think each side has gotten wrong. It's if you are not with us, you are against us. In fact, many would even dispute that the other side can even be right in anything. How can a Trump supporter even be right in the eyes of a Hillary supporter? In anything. Well, I'm not a Trump supporter. I'm very far from a Trump supporter. But as someone whose own country has suffered enough from the US agenda, we were dragged to a war in Korea, we had the US armed civil war, we had the US supported Hyundai, I'm in favor of at least scaling down American wars with intervention. So Democrats used to be for that too in the Bush era, but seem to have forgotten about it for the sole reason that Trump calls for it. We could find similar examples from the other side, of course. So that's another example of toxic politics. It's not the ideas that matter anymore, but who tells them and whether they are on our side. To overcome this mess, we should learn to give credit when credit is due. Partisan politics be damned. People are afraid to do that for the reasons mentioned. If you transgress the partisan boundaries, you get stumped on by both sides. Gilbert K. Chesterton once remarked how crazy it is that instead of bragging of being orthodox, that is of the right opinion, pundits in his day bragged that they were heretics. Something, of course, that actual historical heretics never did. The actual historical heretics would always say they're orthodox. Yeah. And everybody else is a heretic. What's funnier today is that pundits calling themselves heretics just mean heretical as to the other side because otherwise they just preach to their parties or to their social class or to their in-group war everything that it wants to hear. That's not daring to be heretic, that's being a conformist and bragging about it. Thank you very much. Anyway, I have two questions for my friends here. For the ladies. Sound in tweet as part of the Q&A. Okay. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get to the, to the audience. So we have a lot of things. So we have the issue, for example, of immigration as an example of toxic politics. We have the issue of inequalities. I believe you mentioned the issue of daring to take insights. The you mentioned the issue of this, the personal is political, which is basically the new fashion in the UK. Is if you're on a dating site, you have to say, for example, on Tinder, if you vote the Brexit, don't dare swipe right. If you can't even have a fling if you don't agree on the referendum, apparently. So, what does the audience think about all these and uh, questions or contributions or comments? Who is going to make a start and get us disagreeing more? We promise not to burn any heritage. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to say that we are cognitive misers. In other words, we try to put things in people in categories. So it's the same thing with another panel that we had about hate speech. You know, we like to put things in categories. And I think you're right that it's part of uh, identity. And it won't change because this is who we are physiologically. I liked uh, what you said about, you know, we have to agree to disagree. I happen to have friends in this room that we don't agree on politics all the time. And, uh, <laughs> But that's okay because that's that's why we have discussion and we can learn from each other because a, a number of our experiences affect politics. I'll give you an example. When I was living in the U.S., um, I would just save my views and parties, and I would hear some friends look at another friend say, "She's a liberal." I say the same things in Greece. I see one friend look at another friend. She's conservative. So you explain to me, I'm the same person with the same views. I don't like these labels, you know, they're thrown on me. I, I even wrote a poem, labels, you know. But the fact is that it's more organic than that. I think we are just made to, to do this. And I think we have to always have a mindfulness about it. That, you know, at some point if we disagree, we need to take a step back and say, is this really going to make a difference in terms of how I think of myself 
uh, myself as an individual, a global citizen, my community. So I think things change over time. So that's my contribution. Someone else? The gentleman in front. Uh, do any of the panelists development? Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Do, um, the panelists, do they see this uh, development into uh, so-called toxicity as an evolution or a regression? So let's take these two issues first, and then also let's give the open direct the questions to the rest of the panel. Mm -hmm. So shall we start with you then, and then we go in reverse order to address it. Just give my questions. Yes. Well, well but we're also addressing No, no, issue. I won't oh. put the questions on there. Timandra. <laughs> Isn't religion a political belief? When do you take it out of the equation? I mean, I think religion can be a political belief, especially as a social condition, because in many places the, socia the society is created still and exists still as a society, civil society, a civilized society, because of religion. That's why. And Anna. Do we have one identity or everyone? Everyone. So the problem is where maybe, I don't know, I want your opinion on that, that we forget that we have multiple identities and we just take one of them up and make it. Who wants to start in the questions from the panel or from the audience? Who wants to start? Uh, okay, I'll start. Uh, get the hang of the microphone. Um, yeah, there's actually, I think all of those are interesting. Let me see if I can address them without just going on for too long. It is religion a political belief. I think, well, I think one interesting change you see in the way we see the world is that it would have made much more sense, maybe even only 50 years ago, certainly 100 or 200 years ago, to say that religion is. is part of politics in the sense that it was also part of a way of organising society and as you say, part of civil society especially, how we do things. And I think one sign of how things have changed is that religion on the one hand is much more seen as a matter of personal belief, that each individual person can have their own different religious belief and that's fine and we just have to respect it and yet at the same time that makes it part of your identity and that means that it also becomes political but in a different way so that what's political about religion is less well we all value uh, say the role of family and therefore part of our society is founded on how families get together and do things and that's part of how we organize society whereas now it would be more like well yes but I belong to this religion so I believe this so so I insist that society the state everybody else respects my right to have this belief not because this is something we all share, but because I'm different and you must respect my difference. Uh, and then we get to conflicts about, well, okay, but if we respect your belief about this, does that we just mean that we give you space to do it, or do we then have to reorganize everything else around you wanting to do it? And I don't think we've really come to terms with this. I think this is the problem where identity becomes the organizing principle. That to some extent, it's not just about you are free to do what you want to do. It's also about, but everybody else must recognize me doing what I do. And so it, it, it is less the kind of secular tolerance ideal that I have, where everybody has the freedom to, to practice their own beliefs and, and get on with their own lives. And, and, and we see that as a, as a good thing. And more about, oh, well, no, but every, every person's own belief and desire to get on their own life actually demands a kind of response from everybody else and even from, from governments and people in authority. So in that sense, I, I think it is still political, but I think the meaning of religion as a political belief has, has changed. Um, but can I just briefly pick up also on something that the, the, the first person said about asking yourself, is this, is this really going to make a difference? And I think that is also, that's a big change, that whereas, I mean, I remember politics 
when it felt much more straightforward, and maybe this was like pre the end of the Cold War, when it felt much more, this is left, this is right, this is, there are different classes, and obviously they're going to have different political views, and it, it, it felt much, it felt much more cognitively easy, uh, because there was a framework, and you could generally fit things into the same framework. But, and there were strong feelings then. But they were because you want you were pushing outwards into the world. You wanted you wanted to change the way the world was, and so you were joined together in a common project to say if we all push in the same direction, we can change the way the world is out there. Whereas now I feel much more it's it's less about changing the way the world is out there, and it's much more about changing the way I feel about myself and changing the way you all treat me so that I can feel right about myself. So it's it's less that I want my identity. No, it's, it's less that I want my position to make a difference to the world. It's more that I want my identity to be acknowledged. And if my identity is that I'm a, I'm a left person or that I'm a, a good Orthodox Christian or whatever, then I actually want this to be recognised and affirmed by everybody else. And that's the difference that I want. I don't actually care so much about what happens out there. I care more about how people treat me and therefore how I feel about myself. Someone else wants to present some leadership. Yes. Oh. Sorry. I'm sorry, I just want to give an answer to Elabrini. Uh, there are multiple identities, and you're right to point this out because, depending on the context and where we are, one comes forth, let's say, okay? Uh, so, and this is a little uh, a point of. Uh, disagreement with you, Barbara, because yes, there is the cognitive aspect, the biological aspect, and the way we um, not only process information, but the way we um, differentiate people, uh, situations, and all this stuff. But because we have multiple identities and they are not fixed, the external environment, the social aspect, the cultural aspect, I mean, give you an example. Uh, I was brought up in a family which was right wing. I mean, right wing, not extreme, because in this in today we say right, <laughs> we completely think about uh, cotton down. So I was raised by a very democratic father, uh, but I chose my own path. You know, it's not something. Uh, I mean, I was exposed to many ideas. Uh, I, I, I never voted for the right, right? It is not my ideology. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you pointed out that sometimes, even if you are, whether you are in the right or the left, you feel felt that, uh, left out because uh, there is so much toxicity there. That's why I mentioned, look, there are people who, who raise legitimate concerns because they feel frustrated about migration. And the answer is, the moment you say, well, bad, you become a racist. And this mostly comes from the left, right, okay? Uh, not that there is no racism and xenophobia, we, we don't say that. Uh, so um, we have to be very careful because the more we, we do this, we, we will not help it because this is not a dialogue, this is not a debate, okay? Because there is research that can show, like we did that with the Albanians, we did there's a lot of research in Greece, well, not only the National Center for Social Research, everybody has done research on that. We have their narratives, their migration process, which is very different from what it was portrayed in the news, and you know this as a journalist as well. So we want to listen to the narratives of, for example, I'm using the example of the refugees, and present this to the people who are not aware because what they listen is, you know, all the things uh, in the news, right? So that's it. Yes, thanks. To the, uh, the question whether it's evolution or regression, I think it's evolution, clearly. And now we have uh, issues disagreeing. We need to have issues disagree for many, many years after the Cold War. And try to, so in the Cold War it was easier. In left, right, center, that was it. But there are the industrial categories of politicization. Now we're in the post-industrial society. And we're moving to the uh, technological revolution. So right and left will not make sense so much. Now in this globalized village, we are seeking new identities in order to, to exist. You know, to say we're here. We're not just numbers in the economic markets, you know. Uh, and uh, all of this, is, this sounds like a paradox because it reminds us of the Marxist times, of the Stalinist times, 
that people, many people on the East, in Eastern Europe uh, fed like numbers, <coughs> like parts of the economic uh, process only. Now we see the same phenomena uh, regressing in, uh, in, West, in the West. Um, so globalization is very, very important to, to try to understand why we use oh. this multiple identities to make our presence heard. Oh. And when we're not heard, we take to the streets, we take to the social media, we shout. We become aggressive. We say, I'm, I'm right and you're wrong. Because we don't want to listen anymore. Because we believe that nobody listens to us. So I think it's it's evolution. It just shows that issues are back on the agenda. This is healthy. Uh, otherwise, it's the end of history, like Fuyama used to say. It's not the end of history. And it's not, you know, uh, uh, that uh, everything uh, ended. It was terminated in 1991. It seems that uh, the battle of ideas continues, and this is a good thing. Now, um, acknowledgement is crucial, and um, the differentiation between uh, politics and uh, religion is also crucial, I believe, because they have become mixed. And there we have another figure that has created uh, a lot of uh, confusion, and that was uh, Huntington. Mm -hmm. Huntington talked about the class of civilizations, and he really politicized. Religion. religion has another purpose. It's a metaphysical need that it covers. Hmm? What happens after life? What is death and how we should live before that? Uh, we had political religions in the past, in totalitarian political systems, but we're not there now. So democracy tries to combine the metaphysical uh, explanation and the political uh, solutions to the problems. So we have to move away from that, otherwise we're always going to see a big gap differentiating us Christians from Muslims, from Hindus, from whatever. Uh, we cannot speak on, on such terms. Every, every religion will want to become political in their eyes too. Let's go back to others. Actually, one comment though. It was easier for me to come out of my religious response as an atheist rather to my colleagues in the university as kind of sympathetic to Brexit, but thank you. <laughs> okay, we have one, two, and then we'll see. Thank you. Just on the question in the front, I mean, I can talk mainly about UK politics. I think what you've described is a very interesting contribution. A fairly widespread phenomena, but I, I'm not sure if Greece is the same as say, the UK or Germany, whatever. What, what I can say, certainly for the UK, is politics is much more contested than it was 10 or 15 years ago in the time of, well, after the Cold War, then Tony Blair. You know, it, apathy was the word that we talked about. Now the apathy has gone, the politics is tense, contested. I think that's positive, but I think there are many problems with the way it is discussed. Uh, uh, and people are very much, in many, many cases, not the way, you know, talking to like-minded people, if you are an echo chamber of social media, talking across people, not trying to win the arguments uh, and convince people. You want to try to convince people on the other side. And I would say, particularly to students here, firstly, I mean, Constantina makes a point about listening. Listening is greatly underrated in terms of, I mean, I support freedom of speech because I think people should be able to listen to all the different ideas and then that's how you make your opinion. And also, if you want to win an argument with somebody who supports Donald Trump or whatever it is, the first thing you would need to do is understand their point of view rather than tell them they're a terrible person and Donald Trump's got these terrible views. You need to understand why do people support that? What is it? You know, why why will they vote for him even though they might might not like uh, him as a person? So all the understanding those things is you know very important. I would say certainly the organizer of the Battle of Ideas Festival in the UK and whatever. There's quite a lot of debates we have, and you're not particularly on Brexit as that. Well. Quite a lot of debates where it's difficult now. People are very reluctant. You know, they have their point of view. They're very reluctant to debate openly with the other side. I mean, you need to find ways to do that with most issues. But many people are reluctant to do that. And that's a real shame because we need that open debate uh, to move forward. Just to find out an anecdote, I know myself, the biggest shock I had, one of my best friends said to me after the referendum uh, in the UK, where I know many people in Greece don't understand the referendum is all about. We had this referendum and it's very, it's divided the country straight and the Prime 
uh, you know, somebody wrote it a different way from me, and they said to me, one of my best friends said, will you still want to meet me for a drink? And I was really shocked, because it never occurred to me that simply because you wrote a particular way like that, that that person, you know, I might not want to see them again or talk to them. And it, it really shook me, but as Nicholas said, the throwaway comment we did, that, you know, friendships, family, relationships, everything are now in the UK, in many instances, not in most cases, but in many instances, being reorganized around a particular idea and group that you're with, and also in opposition to the other group and what, and what they do, whatever. And to me, that's a, that's a, a, a very concerning problem. That's driving, please. Good evening. I'd like to start with an anecdote to pick up where the gentleman uh, spoke about. I can speak about the United States, though. Uh, I have a couple of friends uh, in the United States where they basically uh, said to me, we, cut, we stopped all communication with a certain person because they voted in the 26th election and the 2016 election for Trump just because he opened support in social media and because he is being very, uh, let's say, cringy about it in a, in a more tribal way of the other side. Uh, whereas those people who cut off from communication with him were his brother and his, and his best friend, in much of that. Uh, I'd like personally to make a statement about the, the whole topic of toxic politics. Uh, I find myself not properly discussing anymore with people because I'm non-partisan. I don't aspire to political parties. I, uh, as Nikos knows, I really hate political parties. Uh, and I cannot discuss anymore with people because they immediately see my non-partisan viewpoint as, hey, you are a social deviant or you are uh, of one side or the other side because of the experience. Yeah. That it's similar to what Labrini experienced. Uh, this is just my statement. I cannot do it anymore. If there is some way to resolve it, I, I, I don't know. I don't know it yet. Uh, one question I would pose is how can education help foster a more healthy debate and curtail this toxicity in political discourse? Go back to, for example, what Socrates did with his dialectic. And do a healthy dialectic without actually killing the other person because of that content controversial opinions. Can I, can I ask a question, not only to the audience, to, to the panel and to the audience, is there a limit to this good and benevolent attitude? For example, I know a guy who, I know he's a very good guy, he's a sweet guy, but he happens to have really, really, really bad views. And when I talk about bad views, I talk about like anti-Semitism, we from conspiracy theories. What is the limit up to which, like, what have you do to go from the category of you're a good guy with bad ideas to basically you are quote toxic, like you're someone that because of your views they're so immoral that I cannot anymore even hang out with you. Is there such a point after which you say, okay, that's too much for me? Like, so you can you can take yeah any questions and uh, or, yeah. <laughs> we'll have another round of one. Personally, I'm saying I can listen to everything and anyone. I can listen and speak with people who vote for Golden Dawn to my fellow artists, and I have no problem with anyone to talk with. There's a line when it becomes a way of intimidating other people or destroying society. So for me, the line is when. When you're talk, you talk, you can say whatever you want. And we'll fight talking. When this passes a line, there's a problem. And that line is how, if you respect people too. I mean, if someone, the, I'm thinking of the guy that has the periphery, the kiosk near my house where I go, and I say, he, he voted for Golden Dawn twice. He's a very nice guy, as you say. But he was never aggressive. He's not a killer. He's like, you know. And now he regrets it, because <laughs> he had to see what, what happened. So I'm not going to you know, see him as my enemy. He's not my enemy. He's not well educated. He didn't have the chances in life that I had. So we can debate. We can talk. 
And if he has problems with his kids at school, then I think Talcoy will help. I mean, you know. But the thing is, you have to draw a line when this becomes a way of destroying the social net. Like if he attacks him, that's what he's talking about. Yes. Like if he engages in action. It, it, not only action, but words can be like that right. sometimes. Yeah. Like if uh, the community takes care of a family as it happens, uh, of immigrants, and he's the one that says no. And we see that in our, in our building. We have three apartments rented by immigrants. And there were some people in the building who discussed that we cannot live with immigrants as well. It's not an action, but it's an action. Right. You know, if you want to throw families out. So. Anyone else who wants to take a course on maybe education question or Jeff Well, then? Yes. Regarding education, uh, we need to organize more debates uh, to uh, educate children and students in the way they must, have, must conduct dialogue, to be able to get into the shoes of other people, to uh, support uh, um, ideas that are not theirs, to take the other side. Uh, we, we see that happening in uh, American colleges and it works, really works, because dialogue is the base of uh, rhetoric and democracy. And if we are strong in that, we don't need to get into toxic politics. And I think uh, people are stronger than people are stronger to deal with uh, toxicity on the other side. Now, what is the, the turning point? I think it's personal. The turning point is personal because sometimes uh, uh, words are deeds, or sometimes uh, words encourage other people to act. I mean, I'm assuming it's uh, perhaps it does not find an impressive uh, um, manner in the same person uh, that talks about, uh, badly about the Jews, people, but uh, he can encourage other people to do it. So I think violence or uh, the encouragement of violence might be the turning point. Uh, to, to be able to talk to people, not to become friends with people. Yeah. This is very personal. Yeah. Uh, of course, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have a, a, a Nazi as a friend. Could, because he supports certain ideas that uh, are against my ideas. But to talk with him, yes, of course, anytime, anywhere. But uh, there has to be a dividing line. There has to be some differentiation. Uh, I think too much tolerance uh, after a while can become very uh, dangerous, especially for ideas that we have experienced what they can bring. Other, other ideas we don't know that they may bring. But they have to know that this is something that has a uh, historical uh, background. It's not something that is just invented now. Because sometimes, you know, it's fashion. You see, young people believe it's, it's fashionable to be on the dawn. It's fashionable to, to beat up people, to make uh, to bully other others all the time. It's not fashionable. It can be dangerous. Yes. Uh uh, taking from uh, where Sadina left it, and you started this, um, in my view, um, considering the political culture of Greece um, after uh, the restoration of democracy, uh, where uh, with the wars, right wing, extreme uh, right, but it was incorporated in, especially in the new democracy uh, party, so these forces were not out from the bottle, you understand that, so it was kept like that. Um, things change, of course, with the uh, referendum and, and all these changes and um, neoliberalism uh, that did not deliver what it was it promised. Um, I don't believe that people woke up, uh, you know, uh, sleep Democrats and wake up next morning become fascists. You understand that? So uh, your friend with the chaos is the disillusion. Uh, disappointed person who thinks that these guys uh, are going to bring uh, a change, especially in the parliament, because they're going to beat up those that we cannot go in and beat up, and, uh, and that's wrong, of course, that was a misunderstanding. Of, and they took the vote back, at least we don't have them in parliament, although there is an openness and others. But I think somewhere those voters understood what this uh, Golden Dome was all about, and that's at least some, somehow optimistic, uh, if I can read the um, outcome of the vote uh, very um, you know, well. So that's the point I wanted to make as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think to kind of pick on that a bit, but also maybe to come back to some of the things that Jeff was saying, I think there's a difference between saying other people that you would not want to be friends with because of what they believe. Well, yeah, always. <laughs> 
friendship is not something we universally extend to everybody, otherwise it's meaningless. Friendship is something we extend to people that we feel we have something in common with. And maybe it's not political, maybe it's just that you they live next door or your kids go to school with their kids or, or whatever. And but often it's because you, you you feel something common about the way you see the world. But perhaps I would distinguish between people who broadly Broadly, maybe want the same things that I want, but just disagree about how how to get there. So, for me, it's about do you do you value human beings? Are human beings at the top of your of, of what you value, uh, or or do you think well, you know, humans are a blight on the earth, and we should care more about plants? And and people like that I find really difficult because every time I meet them, I'm like, well, actually, you know, you prefer that plant to me, so I, I feel I feel a bit devalued. But I think there's a difference between that and who would you have conversations with? And, then, and I think Jeff has usefully raised the reasons why you continue to talk to and continue to have a line of communication open to people, even whose views you find really appalling. And the main reason is that you, you, want, to, you want to change their mind, ultimately, somehow. You, you, you want them to change their appalling views and come a bit closer to what you believe. Uh, of course you do, otherwise you wouldn't believe what, what you do. How are you going to do that if you if you shut off? You leave them no door to walk through to come back towards you. So as much as possible, I think it's important to keep a door open and to talk to people and let them know that there is always the option where they can go, oh, yeah, actually, oh, I just turned to a Nazi there. Uh, I'd like to recount on that. Uh, and you know that somebody is still listening, going, I, I thought that you know maybe that was a mistake and you could come back again. And I also agree with Jeff that the, the key point of that is listening, because in most cases, people have reasons for doing and saying what they do. That to them, at the time, are good reasons. They're as good as your reasons for what you do. And you may look at them and go, that's a terrible reason. You just reacted out of fear and anger and you're blaming these innocent people for bad things that have happened when if you just sat down reasonably, you would see that that's nonsense. But to them at the time, th those reasons made sense. And the more you say, no, that's terrible, I'm not going to talk to you anymore, the more you're giving them an incentive to dig in and go, well, you're an idiot, because my reasons are good reasons. Whereas the more you listen to them and say, OK, I just don't really understand how you got from too many people giving up smoking at your kiosk to voting for Golden Dawn, can you just talk me through what were your reasons for it? The more you give them the chance to actually have to explain themselves to themselves, and then maybe at that point you don't even need to say, you're an idiot, you, you just need to ask them enough questions that they themselves will go, yeah, now I've said that out loud, it doesn't really make so much sense, so perhaps it's much easier to for people to rethink if you give them a door to do that without without losing too much face. And I, I don't want to be too liberal about this. You know, if, if people are, are Nazis are talking about killing people, uh, rounding up and sending them home, then you know those views that I don't think are views that you have to be reasonable and liberal about, but I just think that as much as possible, if you listen to people and ask them questions, you give them a door to change their mind. And also, you're never going to know what are the arguments that are going to make them change their mind if you haven't listened to the arguments that they're making. And also, even if they don't change their mind, other people may be listening or watching, especially if this is happening in the media or social media. There may be other people out there that started off thinking, well, I think this guy talks a lot of sense. And after a while, maybe some of them will come around and go, Actually, no, now he's spelled it out, it doesn't make any sense at all. And this other person is at least being reasonable and civil, so maybe I'll edge this way a bit. The gentleman had a question, we have one more question there, one more question there, anyone else in the front, one more question here. So let's go with these. Actually, let's take all the questions and then we come back to all of them for that like part of what. So we have, where's the mic? Oh. Uh, I just wanted to say about the so, uh, I'd say that most people here will agree that there are quite some bright people that go into politics and that they actually want to do something good about their country, their state, <coughs> or wherever they are. But 
the most of the most of the times they usually get lost, they change their perspective or something else pushes them to become what we say toxic. Uh, would you say that the current parties or the whole but the history of uh, the parties in democracy is the one is one of the things that uh, actually change uh, those people to change their perspective, to change their goals, to make them believe something that they previously didn't believe, and actually change their uh, the things that they want to do. So you mean basically about group things? So because you join a group and that group thinks in a specific way, this kind of changes also your mind. More or less, more, uh, also because of, uh, there are people that actually want to do something in this mm -hmm. world, that they want to try. But going in a political party, there are many the people that have more uh, different ideas than you, uh, have belief strongly in them, even though they, they're not what would actually bring something good. But mm -hmm. in their uh, heads, that or that would be the best choice. Right. So that brings a debate as well, but usually those people are the ones that don't make it hard to the political wall. Yeah, it's annoying. You know someone who's bright, then they become a politician, and suddenly they're like compromising. <laughs> so we have one, two, one red, and then we have someone at the back. Oh no, let's uh, finish. Okay, we go anti <laughs> First of all, I'd like to say that this toxic, right? Anybody here? Uh, first off, uh, this thing about these toxic quality things is new. It's been happening over and over uh, across time. I just think we can see better now because uh, social media give access to pretty much everyone to say whatever they want online with impunity and anonymity. Therefore, any fringe um, viewpoint can be transmitted across the globe. So what I would like to say is that um, uh, oh, I haven't heard you all discuss about fake news, which is a big part of toxic politics. Uh, they did it in Nazi Germany, but now it happens in a degree it hasn't happened since forever. Someone writes an article, and it becomes true, truer than truth. And when you try to disprove it, even if it claims that the Earth is flat, it's suddenly true. People actually start believing that the Earth is flat. So what my question is, how do you argue after a point with someone who believes the earth is flat? The moment someone questions basic principles of dialogue, scientific reasoning, and reason itself, dialogue becomes pointless. So yes, in theory I agree, it is brilliant to say that we can all sit down and have a chat with Nazis, but after a point, when they have given up on reason, you can't, you can't talk, you can't debate. That's pretty much the end of it. You just have someone endlessly spewing vile hatred and conspiracy theories. That's all. The difficult question is how do you know that you've lost your reason? Like everyone thinks they've lost their reason on this side. Yes, that's, that's a very good question. Okay. <coughs> okay, so I think I'm going to start with the discussion. I was thinking whether I should speak and with which of my multiple identities. If I if I should speak as um, a citizen always involved in politics, or if I should speak as a candidate, as I was uh, both in European and national elections this year. And I'm saying that because um, we're speaking about toxic politics, but there is a discussion of our toxic approach to politics. I was tasked, and uh, you know, the fellow here who says about who thinks that no, there can be some people who wants to contribute to this society. And um, this is the situation. Uh, we, we have this demonization of politics. That, uh, and we kind of uh, presuppose that uh, as long as you get involved, this means that there is something wrong. That we, we say that all politicians are bad. Or, but if you want to change the world, you need to contribute. Each of us, of course, from our different role, as journalists, our thinkers, our professors, but possibly as participators, like in our, our most important right to be elected and not to be elected and participate. So I'm saying this because, uh, and of course, I'm, 
you know, it's, uh, it's interesting to, to discuss further because you can still keep your views and your independence. I'm saying because I run with, you know, with, with the left party, but also as independent, I kept my views and my disagreements that were respected. I mean, you can run as a personality but at the same time being attached to a general ideology that you feel that you are closer with. So I want to say that mainly the main reason I wanted to speak is that I have all this thing about all this discussion about the demonization of politics, uh, but it's uh, it doesn't take us further. And of course, I was uh, very happy to hear about emotions of politics. But how can you get how you can, if you are not emotional about it? So I think that if we see politics in a more emotional way. Uh, I'm sure that we can do better politics. Politics is something good. It's, some, it's, the, you know, it's the reason of democracy, the step of democracy, as long as we do it in such a way. And I have to say, I think, you know, I participate in different panels also on TV, and I, I, I experienced several, uh, I have several stories to, to tell, I suppose. But, uh, I suppose that in both elections, you count friends, you don't count votes. Especially with people that you have disagree disagreement, ideological disagreement, and you can discuss. And this is like so valuable. Thank you. The gentleman up there, and then go out the front. Have we got any other people in the team? I just want to say that I'm impressed that you guys are doing this. Uh, the civil discourse in America is long absent. The ability to sit down and just talk is one of the things I really appreciate about the Greeks and Greek culture. We do have coffee for hours and we're, we're going to now start about some four minutes. Um, so one of the things that I really find interesting here is uh, I'm in a, a board about uh, toxic politics and I, I couldn't help notice the concept of toxic masculinity and toxic politics and the dominance of the male persona in politics. And I, I guess the immediate thing that calls to mind is that there's a, a clear need to have a, a breakup of politics from the male balance hierarchy if you look in that behavior trait. Um, as we're sitting in forum, I'm reminded of like multiple books, and I want to show you guys just books to read that help me understand things. One is Arnold, Arnold Mindell's Deep Democracy for Open Forum, and that's exactly what we're doing here, and we're just talking. And we're talking about our emotions and how we feel, and we're looking at each other in the eyes, and that changes the interaction and the uh, even the adrenal response. Um, so it's important people think about the that. Uh, the Deep Democracy of Open Forum by Arnold Mandel. And then we're talking about emotions. When, when you deal with somebody who is not hinged on reality, you don't make a, an argumentation based upon logic and reason. You make an emotional sway. And so that reminds me of Gustav Le Bon's The Crowd Psychology of the Popular Mind. And when you're arguing with people in large groups, you're not arguing with the highest intellect, you're arguing with the lowest emotional common denominator of that group. And so you change your argumentation to, to a really good story, uh, to the emotional uh, feelings that you have, which leads to another book, uh, The Geopolitics of Emotion. And that talks about how politics in, in the modern age are largely emotionally felt and uh, emotionally uh, experienced by regions. So there's cultural narratives, there's, uh, there's political narratives, and, there's emotional narratives. Um, and so I think that when we take into consideration, at least we, what I'm seeing, uh, these types of concepts and we sit down and talk about it, you guys are like a, a shining example. Because you know, you can export this style of ideas, or the battle of civil discourse, uh, and I can help you bring it to America. Please, this is, this is cool. I just really appreciate you guys. You should come to the UK one. There's like more than 3,000 people, all of the more than 100 panels. So if you enjoy this, imagine how much you no, enjoy it. No, it's going to take us to America. We have to come, we have to talk about it. <laughs> Here, here. Uh, yeah, and so that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we have one more question. Hello, everyone. And thank you for being here and organizing all this. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, it all comes down to education, certainly. Most certainly. Um, like, uh, I, I like the view, like the gentleman here said, and Commander also said. Um, uh, it is very interesting to uh, leave uh, room for the other person to understand 
uh, and think about his point, uh, point of view. And this uh, was indeed something that Socrates did. And uh, there is this, uh, uh, well, for Greek education, um, I regret the fact that uh, we don't give time to students to express themselves. One very important thing is that, and take initiatives regarding various matters, just like initiative in Greek school because we don't have time. And um, uh, the other thing, the good thing is that uh, there is a, a very a nice lesson uh, developing in Greek education, but uh, not in the in the um, curriculum, in the basic curriculum. And it's good for the students that are back there to follow um, the rhetoric. Uh, it is uh, very much developed in uh, well, I know in private schools as well, and in English as well. But um, in Greek schools, there is this rhetoric uh, uh, lesson, subject, uh, where they do it as in the past. And they take the subject, and uh, they, they, they pick the pupils uh, split in, uh, in uh, teams, and uh, they argue, they argue they get prepared, well prepared and argue this goes all over the schools and then they have a big competition which comes in March. Uh, so this is a very, very interesting and good thing to happen. And uh, if we, we further develop this and in the basic curriculum, it would be uh, something that we are we can do progress with. And then one, another point that I wanted to Places and uh, we have to play fair. This is also an important thing. Um, I believe let's if we move uh, to another subject like uh, sexual identity, uh, which is a very big uh, uh, issue these days. Um, it is uh, important to express everyone's self, but um, not uh, underground. Let's say self. And toys that are that don't have an identity, and things like that. I mean, and are there are some things, some things like that that uh, make uh, make you um, go to the, the bad side, let's say, make you uh, suspicious of that, and, and uh, it lowers the level of a good. Uh, uh, Stereotype. Yeah. So, panel, here's your mission. In less than two minutes, we need to address how we keep our individuality, reason versus or and emotions, education, and how we deal with people who have given up on the idea of reason. So, and this will be, yeah, we start with. No, no, two for everything, because this will be your parting words. Oh, no, no, two, two minutes each. Let's, let's start with in reverse order. So, first of all, politics are not to toxic by themselves. What is toxic by itself, though, and about good people getting into politics is power. Power is always intoxicated, it's always a distraction. Uh, from if, even if you are the best person in the world, you have to stay out of power. If you see how it went with some people that we see now as kind of uh, the best examples of what we created as people, like from Tolstoy to Gandhi to Martin Luther King, you can see that they avoid power. In a way, what they do, because they know if they get into the power game, they will be destroyed. Power is intoxicating and it's toxic. So, Good people can get into politics, they don't stay most of the time either. That's my personal opinion. Now, uh, education is also tradition. That's why I talked about religion at first. It's not my personal like, obsession, but because in other societies, not in the European societies, religion, and where there's no state that takes care of people, religion and the, the traditional organization of communities is a way to be civilized and to educate. When I was growing up in India about 50 years ago, in Greece, uh, we were three generations, one, two, four generations of women. My great grandmother was still in life. 
And we will do the oregano thing. We will sit outside the table, only women, which is important for me. From all those women, I was the first one to go to college. And we, they will give me the history of the family, of the village, and the traditions, just by sitting there and talking. So sometimes it's not school. It's being able to listen and to have empathy, which is a bigger school than school. So you have to realize where you stand and to see if you have to take the first step. And maybe that is what creates a more, I don't know, more political situation for everybody. Thank you very much. We don't upload now, so we have more time for comments. Thank you. I'm trying to merge the questions about political parties. Uh, women, I guess, and other minorities getting into politics. Yes, I also believe that politics are not toxic as such, but for many, many years, many, many times people did not turn to politics, they turned to other professions. And after the 2008 crisis, they returned to politics and they found shut, shut doors there. I think, especially bigger parties, have lost talents to reform themselves and welcome uh, new people. I'm not saying young people, I'm saying new people, people that have not been in political parties the, the decades before uh, and we've seen that also the participation of women, which is in some cases has increased right now um, being below the average. But we've seen this uh, political crisis uh, going on also in big uh, parties like the Democrats or the Republicans in the US, where they try to find candidates for the next elections, and sometimes they end up with uh, not with the best solutions. So this is a problem with uh, uh, party democracy. Our democracy has to change in order for politics to be able to get, become attractive again for people that uh, uh, are now uh, more eager to contribute to political change. And uh, this is also an empirical knowledge that women, for instance, or other minorities prefer smaller parties because the entry is shorter, the entry is easier. And this happens in Britain, perhaps in Germany. Many, uh, they say that radical parties have a female factor Many radical parties welcome uh, women much better, much more, much better than uh, mainstream parties. And this is something that should uh, alarm us. Um, regarding education, I also believe that education uh, is everywhere. The best laboratory for democracy is the family table, uh, is the family car, whatever kind of family we'd like to see there. Uh, we don't talk to our children now. And we park our children in different activities, but we don't talk to them, we don't listen to them. And this is a big problem for their personalities when they grow. So psychologist says that when they go to school, everything is, uh, has been ended. They are grown personalities. But school can just add some things, but we have to start when they're very, very young. Um, uh, now, um, regarding what, what, what was the other uh, question? Um, the emotions. Emotions were always there. Uh, now we acknowledge them more, and we also were also assisted by progress in uh, science, neurobiology, psychology. Uh, we know more about our emotions, and we would like them to get the knowledge too. Uh, I think this is also uh, evolution that we uh, realize that uh, human beings uh, are uh, uh, consist of. Uh, rational and emotional uh, aspects at the same time. And fake news were all there. But I read many fake news in the papers. So you've heard many fake news on, on the radio. The problem now is that we have masses of unfiltered information. This is a new course which is introduced into schools. How to filter information. How to uh, be able to understand what's uh, right, what's wrong. and not take the easy path. This is a big danger, to take the easy path all the time. And in the end, you end up with conspiracy theories or with uh, uh, lack of democracy and lack of uh, uh, individual strength. OK, uh, I agree uh, with Constantina that uh, we see also not only the participation of women in radical parties, but also in the vote turnout. You see that uh, women tend, for example, to vote for uh, the left uh, uh, more often, at least in, in the Greek case. We've seen that uh, a lot of times when we analyze the vote. 
Um, and now going back to uh, what Labrini also mentioned, I will use the word power corrupts. <laughs> power corrupts and uh, absolute power uh, corrupts absolutely. Uh, so it's not about the good intentions of people who want to join uh, the political parties. Uh, I'll go back to Costandina, it's the way political parties are structured. So I'm, 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 I'm synthesizing both view, uh, points of Platini and uh, Costandina. Uh, it is the way they are structured, they don't uh, accept uh, new, can uh, new candidates, not in the sense of um, age. And uh, also uh, the way that uh, they are structured leads to corruption. Okay, uh, and so we're not against politics or politicians. We, we, we don't say that the politicians are bad, okay? Uh, what, uh, at least on my part, what I said is the way uh, issues are debated, okay? Uh, so uh, that's another thing. Um, and now going back to your question, uh, the theory and the, sen uh, the uh, science, um, well, uh, yeah, there is a problem there. Um, I don't know, because you asked me what uh, I would say to them. Um, I don't know the level of education they have received, the basic physics, so I don't know who I'm spoke uh, speaking to, but my advice would be to take uh, courses in physics or start reading physics, uh, but because this is the only because we're talking about science here, it's not an opinion. It's not, it, we're not talking about whether God exists or not. This is a personal matter. But uh, physics can show us if uh, if Earth is flat or not. Uh, so we should debate on you know um, uh, in relation to science. Uh, going back to what you said. Uh, I will agree again with Costadina. Uh, the moment that uh, students come into even primary schools, uh, they've been, uh, and it is the basic cell of society, democracy comes from home first, last, and always. And then, yes, of course, you need to uh, also have this uh, in education. Um, the moment that you, uh, we allow children to play with their tablets, uh, and the phones and park them there, okay, don't talk to them, don't give them stimulus. Uh, we don't expect the, the teachers at school uh, or society at large just to solve the problem of uh, that, this, this particular problem. Now, I will agree, however, with you that um, we need to hear students express themselves. Uh, depending on the courses, we try and engage them in debates, in discussions, and I'm really fascinated to hear their views. Uh, they, um, they're very clever, they're very intelligent, they, for whatever reason, uh, they may wanna, they wanna participate in a discussion, but when the uh, moment comes, and what my dear students say, shared with me, is that, you know, we may not talk with you in class, but we have heated debates afterwards. That's part of education, okay? That's my answer. Okay, uh, I won't try and answer everything because in any case my fellow panelists have covered a lot of things pretty well. So really I will just try and stick to two points. First of all, the fake news, and you're right that the blurb for the event had a lot of talk about social media and so we've not really covered it that much. I think I mean, I, I do agree, fake news has always been with us, and one thing that's changed in a way is that because we no longer receive our news from just a few channels, a few newspapers, or a few broadcast channels, but we tend to get it, we each have our own personal news channel that comes to us through social media or the internet, and it's edited by, sometimes by algorithms, and by who our contacts are, so we get news from our friends and acquaintances, and so, it's, it's much harder to, it's much easier to spread things that are both true and false, and it's much easier to, to stop things spreading uh, true and false. And we haven't quite learned how to deal with that, but I think in many ways the same tools that we need are the ones we've always had, are the, the tools of being skeptical and testing what we hear and see and read, especially when it confirms what we already believe. Because all of us are much more ready to believe things that confirm what we already thought. And the best one in the world, I have shared things and then discovered they were 
they were jokes or fake accounts or hadn't been checked because they seemed too good to check. And this is a really useful phrase, I think, we should all, in a way, print out and stick on the wall above our computer or, or write it on the outside of our phones. Like, too good to check. Uh, oh, is this study that showed that, uh, what was it, uh, the study that showed that orchestras recruited more female players when the players auditioned behind a screen. Well, doesn't that reinforce everything you always thought about sexist orchestras? Unfortunately, turns out the study didn't show that. Uh, but I used it in a radio program and afterwards discovered it was just too good to check. So we all need to take responsibility, I think, to be more skeptical about the things that back up what we always thought about the world uh, and not just the things that contradict us. Because we're all really good at checking those, right? Uh, but at the same time, to be skeptical but not cynical. Because the, I think one of the big dangers of people that do spread misinformation or misleading framings is that we all just stop believing anything and think that it's pointless believing anything or arguing about anything. There are often calls for, for some controls or for things online to be fact-checked before they're allowed to go out. And tempting though that is, because it's really annoying to see people believing stuff that is clearly wrong, like that the world is flat or anything that I disagree with. Uh, I think that's not the answer, because that is just saying, look, everybody's an idiot and we need to have things curated for us before we read them. And you just have to ask yourself, well, who are you going to trust? Who are you going to trust to filter things and say, this is true, this isn't true? I mean, I, in the UK, we had, a, we had a, a, an official report from the government saying that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction ready to go in 45 minutes, and that was all the backing we needed to go to war and invade Iraq. Uh, with consequences that turned out to be not very good, especially for the people that live in Iraq. Uh, but, you know, that came from the government, so it wasn't until journalists went to check that later that we discovered that that really wasn't true. So, you know, do, do you think, do you trust your government to decide what's true and what's not true? Because there are governments around the world that have passed laws against fake news, and they're using them to say, you can't circulate this because this is not true by the government's levels? Or do you trust Mark Zuckerberg or the people in Silicon Valley to decide what is fake news and what's true? Because nobody elected them, and I, I don't really want them drawing the line. So I think, unfortunately, the onus is on us. Uh, and finally, just to talk about politics, I mean, I'm glad you stood up for politics. Politics is vital. Politics is the way we change things. And also power. I, Yes, it's really, it's really aggravating when you see good people go into politics and then they enter some party machine and then you see them just resorting to the status quo and you think, we voted you in so you could change things. And now it's just more of the same and you become very cynical. But power is the way you change things. And however you try and enter power, and I really hope it's democratically, I really hope it's democratically because Democracy is the power of the people, and everybody, I value all human beings, everybody has the right to a say in what happens, but I'm afraid, dirty as it is, sometimes you have to sacrifice your moral purity and feel less good about yourself in order to make more of a difference to the world, and you can't make a difference to the world without power, and you can't have power without politics, and you can't have politics without argument. Thank you very much. So, can we give a big round of applause for our audience? And one more round of applause for the Hellenic American Union, Hellenic American College, and Nicole.